Barrister Sam Fowles wrote a very interesting article in The National recently in which he explained why Scotland's new hate crime bill, which came into force this week, will actually enhance rather than limit freedoms. I'm delighted to say that Sam joins me now. Welcome to the show. Hi there. Um, I think we should give him a round of applause, shouldn't we? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Cheers. And I have to say something because obviously I, I take very much the free speech position yeah. and it's difficult to get people on who disagree. Mm. So I do very much appreciate you coming on. And I want to start uh, with a question which I also asked Dr. <laughs> Sheridan. <laughs> because a lot of people are unclear when it comes to the new hate crime law, what uh, crimes would be covered or what scenarios would be covered by this law that are not already covered by existing hate crime law? Right, so basically, this law mostly consolidates things, so not that many, but it brings the law in Scotland in line with the law in England. So it adds, stirring up, or it's already against the law in Scotland to stir up racial hatred. It adds hatred based on age, disability, sexual orientation, transgender characteristics and variations in sex. Now, where it goes beyond the English law is it explicitly talking about transgender. The English law doesn't do that, but otherwise it's the same as the English does law it, now. Does it not also eliminate sex from the Equality Act, the list of protected characteristics? No, it absolutely doesn't do that at all. And it's, so uh, sex is covered in the new hate crime law? So sex is, is covered in the new hate crime law. It explicitly says it gives the ministers a power to add sex to that list and in addition to that there is a new law in progress that is going to be a specific anti-misogyny law and the reason they did this um, was because an independent commission he headed by uh, Helena Kennedy KC who's actually one of my personal heroes um, recommended that misogyny should be a, a separate standalone act. So that will be covered eventually in your yep. view. Okay so can I ask you about um, now I know that you've argued about this before about the idea of misgendering mm. and you feel it's a bit of a misrepresentation. So, yeah. in your, so I just want to clarify that. So sure, in your sure. view, because a lot of people are concerned about this, mm. misgendering will never be criminalised under this new law. Well, I think misgendering is purely saying, I don't believe uh, you are the, the gender that you say you are. That's not going to be uh, covered. Saying, I don't believe you're the gender you say you are, and therefore I think you should die, and I'm going to get a bunch of people to do that. That would be covered, because that's a threat. So aren't threats already illegal? Threats are already illegal, and this consolidates that, that law. And it specifically says threats that are motivated specifically by hating someone uh, because they're trans, that's going to be a, a, a specific crime. I suppose what I mean is why would you need to criminalise the misgendering aspect of that when the threat itself is already against the law? Well, it's not criminalising the misgendering aspect of that. It's criminalising um, the hating someone because they're trans. You can like someone and mis misgender them. People do that. People can have a reasonable debate. But if you say, because you are trans, um, I think you're a paedophile, I think you should get burnt, I think you should get assaulted, that's what the, the specific harm that the law is targeting. And the reason that's really important is because trans people are one of the most vulnerable um, minoritised communities, vulnerable to to violence, and that violence has increased in direct correlation with the increase in people saying really, really threatening and abusive things about trans people. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, the idea of calling someone a paedophile, I mean, that's, mm. that's presumably already covered by defamation law in Scotland anyway. Um, but but defamation is very different to criminal law. It costs a lot of money to sue someone for, for defamation. So, for instance, I couldn't afford someone to sue someone for defamation. Yes. So thinking, oh, well, it's, it's fine, someone on minimum wage can just pay 200 grand for... Uh, um, slaughter and may to come and run a defamation case well, for them just isn't really realistic. Okay, so let's look at this um, this idea of. So you're saying that this is specific. This is important. I think. If, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. Your argument is that it's specifically important that this includes trans identity. Yeah, I think that's be important because you say that these, this is a uniquely marginalised group. Mm. But the statistics don't really back that up, do, do they? I mean, if we take the murder rates, for instance, it's, it's quite clear that, um, the, well, I'll tell you, the average adult in England, Wales, has a 1 in 100,000 chance of being murdered in a given year. Mm. The average trans person, 1 in 200 to 500,000 chance. In other words, uh, the likelihood of being murdered as a trans person is much less than mm. other categories in the country. Why are they uniquely, in your view, uniquely marginalised? Well, you've, that's, you've picked one statistic. Another statistic... statistic is that 75% of the trans population have, uh, have uh, su suffered uh, violence, uh, violence against them. So they're more, uh, trans people, for example, are more likely to be raped than, uh, than other people. And the reason this is particularly important is the same reason it's really important that we have laws that protect people from racial hate, that protect people from anti-Semitic hate, that protect people um, from 
I don't know, age-related hate, because these are specific problems that make people particularly vulnerable. But isn't the problem the criminal acts that you're describing? I mean, the idea of uh, rape and the idea of violence, those are the things that we ought to be criminalising, surely. Mm. Well, you know, if someone attacks me, it doesn't matter to me whether they attack me because they don't like gay people mm. or for some other reason. The crime itself is what should be punished, in my view. What's wrong with that? Because the, there's co a correlation between hate speech and hate crime. Is there? Yes. Can you give me evidence of that? Yeah, I can, absolutely. So, and I'll give you the, uh, the UK-wide statistic, because that was the one I was, was looking at in my, um, uh, my, my article, which was in, originally intended for a UK, UK paper. But actually, the paper was too worried about the uh, volume of threats that its, uh, its people would receive um, as a result of publishing that, that piece. And so I gave it to a Scottish paper instead. So. That in itself is one of the reasons. Um, it, over the course of the last 10 years, we've seen an increase um, in the UK uh, in anti-trans rhetoric. Um, the Daily Mail, uh, for example, uh, if you, you can count the anti-trans pieces the Daily Mail runs, and they have increased over the years. Now, when in you the... say anti-trans, let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. I can agree that I think the perception uh, that the number of anti-trans articles has increased is there. I don't think the reality is there. I think a lot of the, what the people are doing, and what I think what you do in your article, is you predicate it on the interpretation that women standing up for their uh, single-sex spaces, gay people standing up for their rights, that this is motivated by hostility, hostility, bigotry, and hatred towards the trans community. I've had a lot of gender-critical feminists on my show. Not one of them has ever I I expressed any kind of hostility towards trans people. Mm. So isn't that about a perception problem? No, because there's... Uh, these articles are based, for example, on saying things like trans people represent a particular uh, violent threat to who, women. Who said that? Um, well, there's articles in the Daily Mail that, that suggest that. There's articles in the, in the Daily Mail. Uh, there's, uh, there's been a, uh, submissions to Parliament which say that trans people are more likely to commit uh, sexual uh, violence. Uh, I think, and, that's, I think, and that's based on I don't, all of that is based on really bad research. I don't research think that's that what doesn't people, hold I, up. I don't think that's what people are saying. I think what people are saying is that when you have a system of self-identification that is then open for exploitation by nefarious mm -hmm. characters who will identify as women in order to get, gain access to the women's estate and women's spaces. I think that's. What, I don't think they're saying that trans people inherently are more predatory. Well, they're saying both of these things. For the the idea, and you know, I've I've dealt with cases of, of sexual, sexual violence, and I can, uh, can say from a fairly expert position that a sign, if someone is going to commit uh, an act of sexual violence, a sign on the door isn't going to stop them uh, one way or another. They're certainly not going to wait until they can identify as a, a different sex before they go and commit sexual so, violence. So we, shouldn't not have, how it works. so we shouldn't have so same sex spaces on the grounds that predators are going to find a way around it anyway. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that argument is not a particularly good one. But what I'm also saying is there are specific stories that have been run. And this is, uh, you can go on the, uh, the UK Parliament website and look at these, uh, these submissions um, that say, based on a piece of re uh, this piece of research, trans people are more inherently violent uh, than cis people, when in fact that is completely uh, not true. In uh, fact, they're less likely to commit well, violent I mean, crimes than I'd be, cis I'd be really... Uh, I would be well, I'd open the idea of you sending me that. I haven't seen those. Yeah, I've, seen, I've seen people saying that self-identification mm -hmm. can be exploited, which I presume you, can, you agree with, right? Well, I think any law can be exploited. Um, I think the benefits of, of self-identification outweigh the risks of it being exploited, because I just don't think it's realistic to but say that, that we've it... got this massive um, array of sexual predators who are waiting until they, can, until they can get the correct paperwork before they start uh, sexually but, assaulting but, people. But it's have... just not realistic. Well, we've seen it. We've seen men identify as women in order to gain access to women's prisons. Yeah, and we've also uh, seen all, lots and lots of different uh, crimes. We've seen, uh, we've, no, and actually, let's correct that. We've seen men I identify as women um, and be put in women's prisons, but actually, identifying as a woman does not give you access uh, to women's prisons because every... But it hasn't. Uh, le uh, and legally, every one of those decisions must be based on a specific risk assessment as so what, it looks what, at the individual. So what risk so assessment so do you if need I'm, if someone's been prosecuted of rape? as in the case of Isla Bryson or Adam Graham. Mm. What risk assessment do you need to, to say, actually, maybe a double rapist shouldn't go into a woman's prison? You assess the risk that they pose to other prisoners. You assess the risk that they pose to themselves. He's a double and rapist. Isn't that enough? Well, in, in that case, actually, the, um, the risk that they are posed to by other prisoners would be, would be assessed as well. Um, I think the Isla Bryson decision, they got that one wrong. And we get public law decisions wrong all the time. That's why I have a job, because I, I challenge the government when they get decisions so, wrong. So, so I it, could, might have challenged that. So, again, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's your view 
I, am I right about this? You, you're saying that men who identify as women should not ever be accommodated in, in women's prisons? No, I'm saying that every prisoner should be assessed for their particular risk profile before they are um, assigned any prison, whether it's men, whether it's women, whether it's solitary confinement, whether it's category A, whether it's category C. And we should make decisions based upon the individual set of facts, not a sort of broad, sweeping culture war debate. No, but it's not a culture war debate. I mean, this is how safeguarding works. When it comes to safeguarding, you uh, apply these principles broadly because of the tiny, tiny minority. Mm -hmm. When I trained to be a teacher, there were checks on me and everyone else doing so, not because teachers are particularly, have a particular predilection for sexual assault, but because a tiny minority do. When it comes to self-identification, we've already seen we have evidence now that men are self-identifying as women and they are going into female prisons. Mm. So surely that's something we should stop. No, I think that is something because if a man, a man is afflicted with gender dysphoria or some, I should say, and by the way, I should say, if someone who is born with male sex organs is afflicted with gender dysphoria such that their real self is a woman, but they, the, the punishment that we are imposing on them by putting them in prison is a sentence of a uh, period of time in prison. We're not imposing an additional punishment on them of uh, effectively making their gender dysphoria worse and, and but, potentially okay. torturing them. Can I just explain so I, that I, I don't want to no, no, but double punish people. But we know that the majority of those people who are going into women's prisons don't suffer from gender dysphoria. They are saying that they do in order to gain access. We don't know that. There's not evidence for that. Well, there is. I mean, OK, I'll give you some evidence for that. So the Ministry of Justice 2020 data found that 76 offenders out of 129 trans women, 58 mm percent. -hmm. Uh, when it comes to women, that's 3.3 percent of women in prison are sex offenders. When it comes to men, 16.8. And this is corroborated by the latest UK census data. So is it your contention then that trans people are just three times more predatory than other men? Or is it your contention that people are exploiting the system? Because it has to be either one or the no, other. It's my, my contention that that research has been repeatedly debunked because actually... The Ministry of Justice data has been debunked? Uh, the research, th that is based on a particular study and in that study they only looked at the most serious offenders. So instead of looking at the most serious offenders they should have looked at the trans population as a whole to look at... No, you're thinking, of a, different study. You're thinking of a different study. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the Ministry of Justice 2020 data which specifically mm. says that 58.9% of trans-identified males in prison are there for sex offence purposes, as opposed to 16.8% of men. Now, you could, you can, if, you, if you want to debunk the Ministry of Justice data, I'm more than happy to hear about that. Mm -hmm. But that, you're talking about a different study there. Is it the case, I, I do want an answer to this, is it the case, therefore, in your view, that trans-identified people are just three times more likely to be predators, innately, which is not my view, or is it the, your view that men are identifying and exploiting this in order to gain access to the spaces, which is actually my yeah. view? No, it's my view that neither of those is true. What's the third option? The third option is you're looking at a really, really tiny sample. So to no, try that's the and, Ministry of Justice data about yeah, all but, prisoners. But the number that you're, the number that you're given is 54 people. Your sample is a fi uh, is yeah. it 54? It's 129. 129. Your number is 129. To try and extrapolate towards an in, uh, about an entire community on the well, basis I'm not of saying data about from a community. Oh, I'm, saying, I'm saying something about the idea that clearly from that there are people exploiting that system. I refuse to believe that there is just a, a, a huge preponderance within that prison community of 129 people who are sex offenders by nature of the fact that they're trans. That strikes me as transphobic, frankly. I think what this is is men identifying as women in order to gain access. That's the obvious and clear explanation here, isn't it? No, it's not at all. You're, look you're looking at a tiny, tiny proportion of people and trying to extrapolate an intention that is not evidenced. And I, so I think before you make any sort of decision about that, you should look at the individuals and look at the individual's situation. But, uh, and that data just doesn't do that. But you understand why women would rather just have a system where men go in one prison, women go in another. I, I mean, I understand how people get there. What I don't understand, though, is why people want to make these generalised rules when actually there is a very, very clear set of rules for um, deciding which prisons prisoners go into, which looks at the individual rather than tapping into what we do know is a culture war. And we've got the we've got MPs on record saying we're going to use this as a culture war point to drive votes. And I think that's a really, really dangerous way of de dealing, with, uh, dealing with prisoners. I would love to talk to you more about this. Sam, I hope you come back on the show because I think we've only scratched the surface <laughs> here. Sam Fowles, thank you very much indeed.